Good afternoon. Welcome to Talks at Google in Cambridge. Today it's my great pleasure to introduce Paul Roberts, who is the author of The Impulse Society. He is also the author of The End of Oil and The End of Food. As a journalist, his writing has appeared in the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, the New Republic, Newsweek, Rolling Stone, and elsewhere. He was a finalist for a National Magazine Award in 1999, and for the New York Public Library Helen Bernstein Book Award in 2005. In the Impulse Society, he talks about how the urge for instant self-gratification has permeated every aspect of our culture, why that's bad, and how we can find a way forward. Please join me in welcoming Paul Roberts. Hello, Cambridge. So, can everyone hear me who wants to? Good, right on. So thank you for the kind introduction, Jonathan, and uh, thank you all for coming out, especially to hear uh, someone who writes books with titles like The End of Oil and The End of Food, because you know it's probably not going to be super cheery. So um, uh, yeah, I've just published a book called The Impulse Society, which there were some copies over there, and uh, we're going to be d discussing some of the ideas and arguments in there, but before I get to that, I wanted to open that, w uh, preface that with, with a few remarks about publishing generally, because as you guys know, publishing is sort of being transformed by the, by the nanosecond. Uh, I mean, the business is going through some great changes. And um, the act of publishing is just, I mean, even for someone in the middle of it, it's, it's, it's bizarre. You know, if you, if you publish a book, you're expected to promote it, which means writing, among other things, it means writing op-eds and articles and then publishing them. And because they're being published online, it means sooner or later you're going to be confronting who? The troll, right? I mean, and you all know, the troll, they work, they operate in the comment section, and you know, they're pretty nasty, but when it's directed at you or something you've done, it's like getting punched in the nose. It's amazing, you know? These guys are just brutal, and I'm reading these comments last week, and they just, oh, you're just going smack, smack. It's like, and I, my reaction isn't to get angry. I'm like, oh, the guy just doesn't understand me, you know? He, we, we need to straighten this out. Like, if he just texts me, text me your number, dude, and we'll like hang out, right? And, my editor is saying, don't read the comments, and don't treat these people like people, because they're not. By the time they're trolling, they're not people. You know, and he's being really protective and fierce, you know, but there's some truth in that, right? Because, I mean, the circumstances of trolling are pretty dehumanizing. I mean, for the troll, you know, because if you think about it, it's like we, we give them this technology and this sort of culture that arises around that technology that allows them to sort of disengage from a lot of the social rules and norms that would ordinarily prohibit that kind of nastiness. Now think about it, I mean, they're sitting there in you know, near total social isolation, you know, their parents' basement, and they're, they've got this technology that allows them to sort of gratify any thought, the nastiest thought, instantly, and without fear of consequences. You know, they're, they're operating totally anonymously, and I think as importantly, they're not there when their comments are read, so they don't see me burst into tears, you know? So they don't have to bear the witness and, and feel that social pressure that, again, would ordinarily sort of keep that kind of nasty impulse in check. And, you know, you, you realize that when you, when you give people the capability to disengage from these social norms and to pursue immediate, narrow self-interest, the temptation to do just that is really strong, you know? Now, um, and I'm talking about trolls, of course, but it does raise the question, at least in my mind, what would happen if you ran a whole society like that? I mean, what would it look like if there was, hypothetically, this socioeconomic system that, you know, one of its functions was to provide individuals and institutions with a huge amount of capability, some of which could be used to disengage from restrictions, including social restrictions, you know, norms. What would, what would that society look like? And, you know, if you look at the title of my book, you know that I think we know what it looks like. I think we, we live in a society like that, or we live in a society that's becoming like that. Now, no, we're not all trolls in basements, at least I really hope you guys aren't, but we, we, we do live in this socioeconomic system whose function is to provide a lot of capability, the capability to sort of order your life the way you want, and, and part of that reordering is to engage and disengage from the social structures at will. 
And, and as you're able to do that, you're able to, to do a lot of things, but one of those things is to pursue narrow, immediate self-interest. And, and I think that's what we're doing. You know, it's not happening all, it's all at once. We're not always doing it all the time. I mean, you all managed to get here to work without running over people, you know, I'm assuming, and you know, shouting invective out the window. But incrementally, I think we're becoming a society that because we have this capability, we're focused more and more on immediate, narrow self-interest. And you can see it everywhere. I mean, you can see it in the way individuals struggle to sort of manage all this power, uh, but you can see it institutionally. And, and importantly, you can see it in the institutions that traditionally we've relied on to sort of help in individuals manage all that capability. So obviously the political sphere and the financial sphere, you know, we, we, we've seen individuals and institutions in the financial sphere gain a huge amount of capability to sort of pursue immediate narrow self-interest, and they have. And, and the effects all haven't been all great. So, you know, it, it turns out, in my, my, I'd argue that you can't run a society like that. You need to have a society that's more focused, at least some of the time, on some of what I'd call more traditional values, including patience and self-discipline and a belief in something larger than the self, at least some of the time. Because if you don't have that, society can't sustain itself. And it seems to me that figuring out how to restore some of those values in a socioeconomic system that's so busy giving us all this capability, somehow finding a way to balance all that is one of the top questions we need to confront. So that's sort of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and there will be obviously an opportunity for questions and you can throw things and things like that. So um, I started looking into this uh, a few years ago. I was doing this book on food and initially my interest was understanding the economics of the food industrial complex. But you know, I got into it and it didn't take too long to realize that the, the more interesting narrative, at least to me, was the way that the food industry has sort of dissolved the social bonds that were once associated with food. Because if you think about it, you know, food traditionally has been like this intensely social affair. I mean, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't consume a single calorie without engaging in one social hierarchy or another. And that's been that way for, you know, since the beginning, really. And what the food industry has done is it's changed all that, you know? And I mean, think about the last 150 years, the food industry has made food, I mean, a heck of a lot cheaper and made it so much safer, more convenient. More interesting, it's made, it's made, uh, it's, it's allowed us to sort of, uh, we have so many options, food options, that we can kind of create um, the perfect menu for ourselves. And we, we have total caloric self-expression, if you think about it. I mean, the food industry has even gone so far as to sort of help us not even pay attention to the social and political and environmental realities that go along with food production. We can sort of eat guilt-free if we want. We're allowed to do that. And, and you know, if you consider what that means, it means that we have this freedom. We're no longer required to, you know, wait on our mom to feed us. And, we, uh, you know, because it used to be the, the homemaker controlled food output in the household, and you ate what she cooked when she cooked it, and you didn't complain, and you probably had to sit through two, maybe even three family meals and endure the socialization process that went along with those. And uh, it was pretty restrictive, and now it's, that's gone, from, or, it's, or it's disappearing, right? So we've got this incredible amount of freedom. Um, and in, you know, that's the good news, we've got all this freedom, but the bad news is we've got this incredible amount of freedom, and in some cases, we go too far with it. It's sort of a free-for-all, and I wanted to share this picture from my favorite news source these days, um, The Onion. And this is, true story, naturally, this is, the, the ad, this is about a new ad that Arby's is running, and for $2.99, customers will be allowed to leap behind the counter and scoop up big handfuls of roast beef, right? You know, and, <laughs> And, you know, to the degree that you find that funny, it, the joke is that it's not, I mean, it's only like an angstrom from being true, right? I mean, I, you drive by Arby's, and if you're not familiar with the place, you might look through the window and kind of expect to see this going on. And it's not just Arby's or fast food, it's the whole food system, really, you know? Um, and we, we, it's sort of become this free-for-all where we are encouraged and, get, and empowered to sort of dispense with any sort of norms that would otherwise help us think about managing our, our consumption. And, and it's not just the food industry. I mean, anywhere you look, you know, credit, um, automotive, you know, personal technology. I mean, the financial industry, you know, to go back whipping on them, um, you know, it kind of reminds you a little bit of what goes on on Wall Street. I mean, I think the one guy there, is, isn't that Jamie Dimon? I mean, it sort of looks like him. Okay, so, so 
I think we've seen enough. Uh, we, can, uh, we can move on now, but uh, we can go back to that later for uh, a second look if we need to. So, you know, I'm not suggesting that, that we've all, that we're all sort of practicing the equivalent of leaping over the counter and scooping up big armloads of roast beef. I mean, what I'm talking about is much more of an incremental, an incremental process. I mean, we have added incrementally the sorts of capabilities that are available to, to individuals and institutions to pursue self-interest, and incrementally our behavior has changed. And the way incremental change works, you don't notice it, don't notice it, and then one day you wake up and you go, wow, things really are different now. You know, and I mean, look at social media. You know, it's cliche to even bring this up, but I'll bring it up. You know, we do things now routinely that we would have considered obscene, you know, like two decades ago. I mean, if we go back to, I mean, for me to do back in high school what I do routinely today, and I went to high school in the late 70s, so a long time ago, but what I'd have to do is get up super early, right, and spend the morning taking pictures of things like my face and my breakfast, maybe the cat, you know, and then I have to go to school with this stack of pictures and hand them out to people, saying with each time I hand it out, hey, like me, like me, like me, right? And the thing is, I don't know about your high school, but if I had done that back in the 70s, every time I tried, I'd be gotten punched, you know, because you just didn't do that. You didn't say like, you know, you don't self-promote. Dude, who the hell do you think you are? You know, it was just unheard of. And yet now we just, you know, we share, we post, we declare the most mundane or intimate or mundane intimate thing. And, we, and plus we expect to get affirmed for it, right? We expect to get a reward, you know? We expect that someone will like it. And I mean, admit it, how bummed you are when you post something and no one likes it right away. I mean, you sp I spend the day kind of pouting. It's like, what did I do wrong? And how come he posted a picture of the same cat and got like 130 likes, you know? So if you think about what's happened, we've just, we, we've incrementally added this power and it's sort of changed our behavior such that not only are we posting all this stuff, but we've created this new system for valuing ourselves and it's and and you know the provocative postings get more likes. So naturally, what happens? I mean, the incentive system changes, so people are more provocative in their posts. So you have you have these kids killing themselves to take these wild selfies, right? And um, you know that woman in uh, in San Francisco after the earthquake. So she she crosses the police safety line to stand underneath this sort of collapsing cornice to get a selfie. And the only reason she's not dead is because there was not an aftershock, you know. And, and she just couldn't see the absurdity of what she was doing because she was so excited. I was guessing, I didn't talk to her, but she was so excited about this thing that she was gonna be able to post, you know? And, and that really, for me, sort of underscores the danger of this self-centered you know, ecosystem that we're creating. And it's not just that we overindulge, and it's not just that we you know, bankrupt ourselves, and it's not just that we're having trouble thinking about long-term challenges. It's on top of all those things, it's the fact that we're so focused on self-gratification and by extension the self, that the self begins to sort of balloon in our field of vision, right? It gets so big we can't even see around it. You know, we stop thinking there are other things. It's just, wow, it's there, it's me, this is great. And, you know, uh, humans have a sort of finite attention span. It's a sort of finite resource. And that may change, but right now, you know, we have a limited bandwidth and if we're focused on self-gratification and by extension the self in part because the marketplace keeps delivering all this capability to allow us to focus on the self and self-gratification if we're doing that we have less attention to devote to other things including complex long-term things that aren't directly about the self and I, I, I think I, I don't think I need to tell you guys that this is the wrong time to be self-absorbed you know there's so many things we need to be looking at long-term challenges and one of the reasons I think we're struggling with that is because this, the whole socioeconomic system is sort of reorienting itself around the self. So what do we do about that? You know, how do we, how do we step back from that? Um, and you know, it, it sort of, as soon as you start talking about self and self-gratification and the power to self-gratify, it's pretty awkward, especially in this country, because this culture in particular doesn't take kindly to suggestions that we curb the power of the self. You know, we don't like curbs on individual power. It really bugs us, and it has since the beginning. And on top of that, I mean, you know, optimizing or maximizing individual power has been the point of our economy for like, what, the last 10,000 years? I mean, that's the goal of economic development, is to give individuals the power to order their life, or their lives in ways that suit their preferences. You know, more of what you want, less of what you don't want. 
And, and that's what technology is about. I mean, if you take technology as a sort of subset of economic development, I mean, that's, technology allows us to do those things, and it allows us to do great things. I mean, again, I, I don't need to remind you of the, the sort of the, the cusp, the, the edge of the thing we're on right now, about to embark on this entirely new way of being, much of being driven by data technology, and the power that that's going to give the individual and institutions to, to, to focus on, among other things, self-interest. And so we really need to sort of understand this, this power. The, not just the double-edged nature of it, but, but how do we manage this? How do institutions and individuals sort of manage the pursuit of self-interest in ways that don't completely wipe out the rest of us? You know, and, 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 with, and, and again, without sort of imposing some top-down solution that A, never works, and B, will be resisted ferociously. You know, and, and, and for me, really the only way to even talk about this without getting stoned I mean, having rocks thrown at you, is, is, to, is to sort of approach it by discussing the nature of the power itself. You know, understanding the nature of the power itself, this capability that the marketplace is producing so much of. Because I think when we, when we do that, people can begin to at least consider, you know, how useful it is to use it and how they're using it and whether they want to keep using it in the same way. I mean, um, I mean when we look at, say, the nature of a lot of the power that comes out of the digital realm, we see that there are a lot of risks involved. I mean, clearly, data breach is one, just one example. And it's forcing people to recognize that, wow, on the one hand, I'm getting all this power. On the other hand, I'm exposing myself to all these risks that I had that just are unprecedented. We don't even know how to catalog them all. And you know, so that sort of points up the, one of the risks of the power. And, and you can go through and sort of, you can sort of help people understand that all this power comes with all these caveats. And, and more and more caveats. And some of those caveats we're still sort of figuring out. So that's one angle. But I think more fundamentally, what I think is, is critical for people to understand is that the power that the marketplace is sort of ladling out at such copious volumes is it doesn't really have anything to do with us, with the recipients, in many respects. It's, it's not our power. We didn't make it. In many cases, it's produced by a producer, you know, thousands of miles away. Um, uh, you know, an automaker, um, Google, you're creating all this power, and your agenda may not be the same as the agenda of the people who are using the power. In fact, you might not even care. And I'm not saying you as in Google, I'm saying you as in producers. And, and this is sort of, you know, like companies are producing all this power for consumers, not because they care about those consumers, but because it's the most efficient way to meet their revenue targets. And that's how business works, right? But um, in the context of this concern that we might have about a a socioeconomic system that's becoming more and more self-absorbed. This gap between the agendas of the producers of all this power and the agendas of the users, namely the individuals, that gap becomes really important in this consideration of how we're using this power and how we might manage it. So one way to sort of think about this is um, the, uh, what I call the horsepower race. So this is the, 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 the huge sort of competition between automakers during the middle of the last century, it begins in the middle of the last century, uh, to, to make more and more powerful cars. And it was sort of discovered by accident in the late 1940s. Oldsmobile, they come out with this new car. It's a mid-sized car. And they're about to release it with a mid-sized engine. And the one guy says, yo, let's put this new V8 in it we've got. We just invented this V8. So they did. And it like, goes super fast. It wins all these races at NASCAR. And it just sold like you know, potato chips or whatever. And all of a sudden, all the automakers realize they've got to have these performance cars. And so the industry totally reorients. All these engineers that have been spending all their time trying to make engines more fuel efficient are now like, screw that. You know, and they're just, every year they're coming out with more and more horsepower. So it's like turbochargers, and then superchargers, then two-barrel carburetors, then four barrels, then six-barrel carburetors. You might as well have just a monkey up there pouring gasoline into the engine. And the, and the horsepower curve is just going up. And, and we're just you know, we're sucking it up. We're loving it. We motorists. Um, and, and, and part of that is because cars were a little bit uh, underpowered, and it was nice to have a little more, you know, go, a little more juice when you were merging with traffic. But for the most part, it was just we wanted it. We didn't need it. We just wanted it. And why did we want it? Well, Detroit was super interested in this, and they, this is the beginning of the sort of the, this is the psychological era of, of marketing. And they put teams of psychologists on. There's a lot of Freudians and they're, they're sort of surveying their consumers. They're finding out the top reason was we just like to go fast. We just like it. It's like, it, it's fun to accelerate. I mean, for the same reason you like a, a roller coaster. And then, but there was all these psychological reasons too. We're using power to, 
sort of compensate for a feeling of a lack of power in other parts of our lives. So, you know, lack of power at work, maybe, or in our suburban lives, or our marriages, whatever. And of course, these are all Freudians, right? So of course, they're going to say that. But, but the, you know, the story is, it, it makes sense, you know? And so, and, and Detroit's loving this because, like all industrial sectors, they've built these huge plants that were necessary to get the scale in order to bring the price of cars down so that everyone could afford one. But once you have that scale, you've got to keep the throughput, the volume going, or you can't pay for it. And you know you can't run scale or volume on a needs-based economy, so you need to sort of you know focus on wants. I mean, this is all old news, but the way they were focusing on was, was horsepower. So um, that's all great for Detroit, but you know of course the problem is consumers are using all this power, and the way you sort of use the power, sort of get value out of the power, is you go faster. And um, you know they tripled the horsepower, more than tripled between 1948 and the early 60s, and and the top speed went from like 85 miles an hour to 145, and we weren't all going 145, but our speed was up high enough that we were getting in these horrific accidents. I mean, the rate of fatal crashes is, is pretty much paralleling the horsepower curve, and the carnage is just piling up. And you think about what's going on. It's like we're taking all this power that Detroit is giving us uh, because it sort of has to, and we're using it to sort of project our inner turmoil on our neighbors to, with sometimes lethal effects, right? We're sort of using the power to rebalance our internal imbalances, and, and which is kind of nutty if you think about it. And, and, and what's, I think the important thing is the decision about whether we're gonna do that, use all this power to project our sort of, you know, idiosyncrasies and insecurities onto our neighbors at sometimes lethal, with lethal results. That decision is, Think where that's being made. It's, it's not just being made in our own heads. It's sort of being made throughout this whole system. It's being made in part by the designers and financiers in Detroit who are deciding how much horsepower they have to offer each year, and you know, new horsepower they have to offer to sort of keep meet their own targets. And this isn't to sort of uh, let the consumer off the hook. I mean, ultimately the motorist has to make the decision. But if you if you think about it, that decision has sort of been outsourced. And what's happened is. What would have been, I think, traditionally much more of a moral decision, you know, or at least considered in a moral framework, do I want to take my, say, anger or my insecurity and sort of take it out on my neighbor? That question, that that which would have been sort of discussed in human moral terms, that's been sort of left to the marketplace. And the marketplace is, is all about, yes, yeah, of course you would. You know, the marketplace just says, yeah, we're going to put out more power because we need to. And so we've We've, we've effectively embraced and absorbed and internalized the values of the marketplace without really discussing it. I mean, there was no referendum held in the mid-50s. You know, should we be doing this? It was just sort of done incrementally. And, and that became sort of the model. And, we, and there was no debate over it. And, and it's not just obviously in Detroit. It's everywhere you look. It's pretty much every consumer sector where power is being handed out. Um, and, and that became sort of the model, you know? and. And uh, there were people concerned about it, but, but at the time, this is sort of the Mad Men era, you know, there's still a lot of uh, safeguards. I mean, namely, there's a, a regulatory state that's so powerful, it's not afraid to get in there and regulate the hell out of business and penalize and sort of intervene in all these different ways. And business is much more sort of cowable and, and more easily cowed. And we sort of kept things in line, but um, all that goes out the window in the 70s and 80s. When we have these, I mean, how many people here are like super familiar with economic history of the 70s? None. Okay, so I'll keep it super brief. But I mean, basically, we had these two huge shocks to the system. And the first was the, you know, the computer revolution, which, among many other things, allows business to sort of accelerate and intensify and render more efficient this process of creating capability and selling it. So there's that going on. And then at the same time, there's this sort of ideological slash financial revolution, which we sometimes call the shareholder revolution when we're feeling like having a sense of humor. And what happens there is that you know, we have this massive recession in the early 70s. Oil prices, foreign competition, the bottom falls out of the market. The post-war economic miracle that America had been so proud of just evaporates. And, and everyone is hurting, right? But the people that complained the loudest were the shareholders. And they basically told corporate America, they said, if you ever let share prices fall as far as they have, and, and the stock market lost half its value, if you ever do that again, here's what's going to happen. We're going to take over your companies, we're going to fire your asses, and we're going to break the companies up and sell them. And they did that. They, they demonstrated that they could do that. And corporate America was like, whoa, wow, that's, ser that's some serious business. So they completely reoriented their strategy. And they began to focus primarily on share price. 
and on the things that contribute most readily to share price, which is generally um, next quarter's earnings. I mean, there's a lot of debate about this, about what actually leads share price, but really what it comes down to is it's next quarter's earnings. And that became the thing that you would fight for. That became the thing you would do pretty much anything for. And to make sure that corporate management sort of got this lesson, to embed this idea, this ideology, deeply and permanently in corporate management, we changed the incentive structure. So no longer would you be sort of compensated with mainly salary and bonus. You would be compensated increasingly with what? Yes, that's right. And so think what happens now. The manager sort of overnight, relatively speaking, goes from being a manager to an investor and suddenly realigns to a degree that was unprecedented with the stock market. Now, this is a, you know, from a historical standpoint, this, is, this, this marks a, a, a radical, fundamental break with what had been going on in corporate America for most of the post-war period. For as much as we like to, we, um, some of us, like to uh, poke uh, the corporate world in the eye today, corporate America had been sort of the, the, the parent, the sort of the sensible parent of the economy in the post-war era in the sense that they, these companies were the ones that made the long-term decisions and had the discipline. You know, they made huge long-term investments in new plants, opening new markets, developing new products, huge investments in R&D. I mean, the, the, the money that was put into basic research, you know, the kind of research that you don't even know if it's going to come up with anything for 20 years, a lot of that was coming from private industry. And the investments they made in their workers, I mean, it was constant training because you had to you know, keep your workers up to speed with all this technology that was being developed. And all these companies that had in, in, internal universities. And so there was co these constant long-term investments. And they weren't doing this because they loved us. They were doing it because this seemed like to be the most um, practical way to sort of sustain prosperity. And at the same time, government was sort of leaning on them because government was willing to do that. And labor was much stronger. But there was also a sense that this was the way to long-term prosperity. So all of a sudden, that, that's pretty much out the window. There's this much more you know, sort of intense focus on near-term results. Lots of ramifications of that, and I'll just limit it to a few. One is that companies are much more willing to do kind of whatever it takes to get those earnings. And so we see, not coincidentally, the rise of the uh, you know, accounting fraud scandals. So you go from, you go from companies, you know, there would be like six earning restatements a month back in the 80s to like, you know, or six earnings restatements a year to like 20 a month. An earning restatement, for the few of you who don't know, is basically where you say, we lied. You know, we, 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 we made a huge mistake in our earnings, and for some reason, they're not as high as we thought. So you have that going on. Uh, you know, the Enron scandal is a great uh, sort of a extreme example of that. And then you have um, the focus on cost cutting, because that's one of the, the, the quickest ways to raise earnings is to cut costs, even though it can be hugely problematic down the line. So all of a sudden, downsizing becomes, it goes from being an emergency measure, which is what it had been during the, the post-war period, to something that's almost routine. Um, with all sorts of effects on the job market. So we, don't, we not only lay off routinely, but we've cut so much on employee training. It's just unbelievable. You know, we've, we've left ad employee advancement to employees. You know, you're sort of on your own, dude. Um, and we've, we've, uh, we've taken up all these gimmicks. I mean, the share buyback is a classic example. You basically, companies are spending billions, I mean, trillions of dollars collectively buying, like not new products, new technology, certainly not hiring new people, but they're, they're buying their own shares. Because you take shares off the market, the remaining shares, the price goes up, makes the company look great, but you haven't really done anything, right? You haven't expanded business, and you sure as heck haven't hired anyone new. And that's become sort of routine. So like in the years, the two, the two years before the, the financial meltdown, um, the 500 companies on the S&P 500 were spending 70% of their profits on share buybacks. Okay, so think about that. It's like, well, let's make the bubble even higher so when it crashes, the damage will be worse, and let's so deplete our cash reserves that when it does happen, we'll have to go to a government for a bailout. I mean, it's like win-win, right? And you'd think they'd learn. Well, no, you probably wouldn't think that, but they haven't. So that, you know, last year we spent like $600 billion on share buybacks. And so and if you think about what's happening, the, the, it's almost like corporate America and the consumer sort of traded places. You know, the corporate America now acts like a consumer, and sort of a youngish consumer. And the consumer is sort of acting like corporate America, and we're really focused on quick returns ourselves. And um, you can sort of see this, this, this sort of personalization of the entire economy 
you know, the, the entire economy begins to sort of shape itself around these, this kind of short-term agenda. Um, so it's everything from the way we invest, the kinds of innovations we, we invest in. Um, you look at things like, uh, um, uh, well, well, like so Amazon Fire, I mean, you probably read today they've lowered the price to 99 cents. Way to go, that's, you know, but, but think about what the fire is about. Um, I think this is really fascinating. So the fire, as a few of you don't know, it, it's, it's killer app is that you can take pictures of anything and it will identify it automatically and then take you to a link on Amazon where you can buy it. And they sort of act like it's no, it's sort of a world phone, like you're walking along, you see a rock and you can scan it and see if Amazon sells, of course they do, right? But really what it's about is it's about showrooming. You know, it's like going to a showroom, going to Target or JCPenney or whatever, the, the more hapless the better, right? And walking in there and, and buying the stuff in there. And of course, the phone comes with a year of Amazon Prime, so you can just you can buy the thing while you're in the store and then have it delivered for free two days later. So it's super, I mean, think about the individual capability you've just been given. It's great. But now think sort of socially what's going on there. So you walk in and you ask the sales guy, hey, can you take me to the big screen TV? You know, and you've got your phone in your hand and you sort of do the scanning and you kind of look in this guy as you're sort of one clicking him out of a job, right? Because that's what's happening. So there's going to have to be this new social form that will arise where the facial expression that you have and the tone of voice when you're sort of one clicking a person out of their job. It's sort of like, hey, sorry, man, but you know, you understand, you know, of course they don't. But so there's that. It's like this economic violence that, that it's, I mean, we've, there's been economic brutality since the beginning, right? But this is like, it's so intimate. It's like right there, you know? And um, I just think that's brutal. And then on top of that, it's so short term because if we're all showrooming, there can't be any showrooms. I mean, even if you like remove 20% of their business, you're going to hammer so many showrooms that there just won't be any left. Why would they, why would they fund something that Amazon or anyone else, these, you know? So, so basically, what are you going to do with your great phone? You're going to take a selfie of you in front of this abandoned store. I mean, that's kind of the, and, and, so, and so much of our innovation is really so focused on the near term without you know, and it makes it so it makes it easy not to think about those long-term consequences. And more and more, that's what our economy does. You know, and and not to take away from all the stuff that's completely opposite. I mean, there's so much stuff where, where the potential for sort of good and things that you know build society is out there. I, I'm not suggesting that's not the case, but look at where our investment flows and look where our attention is directed. You know, it's 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 often as not it's it's not at those sort of positive developments. And that's not entirely the media's fault. And you know, I mean, think about the way that the big data, you know, big data, the potential for that is, is just, it's massive. You know, um, personal medicine is just one example. But, but big data also has a lot of um, other ways they can be used. I mean, I don't need to tell you this, but I will anyway. I mean, think about, you know, think about the porn industry. You know, how's that for a conversation stopper? Um, I've done a lot of research and, uh, but I mean, the porn industry is a great example of how technology has altered behavior. Because you know, up until like the 70s, porn was, you know, it was, it was sequestered away in these dark places because in, you know, we had a lot of social rules against it, but we also had no sort of technological way to, to liberate everyone's sort of porn appetites. So you had to go to the seamy side of town and, or watch it in your, your house with the little you know, eight millimeter, you know, and, and that was it. And so, so it was this tiny little marginal activity. And then video comes along, and all of a sudden, the cost of making a porn flick just drops. I mean, the cost of making a color of porn flick dropped by a factor of 20. So all of a sudden, you could just churn these things out, you know, and you could just, they just poured into the marketplace. I mean, the number of titles released just goes up. It's more than the horsepower thing. It's, and and what, so what happens is, not only does it become more easy to access, so there's freedom there, you know, and people can watch it if they want. They can watch it in the privacy of their home, and they don't have to worry about what other people say. And that's, you know, I mean, that's their business, as far as I'm concerned. But consider this. Porn is now so varied, and there are so many options, and there are so many genres and subgenres and sub-subgenres. I mean, you have no idea the things that you can find out there that are sort of designed specifically for very particular tastes. And so what you have is this sort of porn world where people can watch the bizarrest sort of activities, and they can sort of talk about them with other people that share that taste because there's a nice little network for it. And so it normalizes it. It becomes this thing that like, well, doesn't everyone do this thing? 
And so when they attempt, if they ever do, to sort of re-engage with, with mainstream society and go on a date, it can be really tough because the real world doesn't look a thing like what they've just gotten used to. And, you know, okay, it's like sort of amusing, but, you know, and porn is an extreme example, but we are allowing people to do that in every realm. It's not just porn. You know, and, and so it raises this really interesting question. It's like, how do we optimize this capacity for the individual to sort of create these worlds that are totally personalized and so give you the freedom that, you, that, that people deserve to have and yet at the same time allow people to have the capacity to re-engage socially? You know, how do we do that? How do we rebalance that? I think it's just, it's just it's super tough, you know, and... and uh, and, and, and I guess more generally, how do we step back from this sort of impulsive, self-absorbed society that I've been describing? Well, I'll tell you. Um, and it'll, it'll, it'll sound like I'm just giving you more bad news, but I'll tell you the story about this guy I met when doing the book. His name is Brett. And he was a fellow, he was a gamer, online gamer, and he played World of Warcraft obsessively. He just had played it for, for four years. And sort of his online ver you know, self was super successful. He was like one of the best players in the world, and he was sought after, and he was, it was like being a rock star, you know? In his real life, things were just falling apart, you know? He, he was, his, his, his health was declining, his, his, his schoolwork wasn't <laughs> going so well, um, socially he could hardly even have a conversation, and he, was, he, re, he finally reached the point where he knew that um, he was in serious trouble, you know? And he recognized that this world that he that was kept giving him more capabilities, kept sort of keeping him on this treadmill, but they weren't real capabilities at all. He finally he finally had to go cold turkey. He he, he completely just he pushed back, and put, checked himself in for treatment. And I'm happy to report that he's you know actually doing he's doing great. Um, and there's a lot of people who are in the same boat who've had to make that same decision. And you're thinking, what does that have to do with me? Because you know, or you, or anybody? Because the whole world doesn't spend all its time you know battling aliens, but in a sense, the world that we're creating, this, you know, hyper-digitalized socioeconomic system does give us, there's an analogy there where we are, we are being given powers that are approaching those. And, you know, the question is, where do we go from that? And I think that Brett's example is a good one for us to consider. He pushes back, and what happens when he creates space between himself and this sort of market-driven system with its market-based values is he allows his own values to sort of reassert themselves. And it, at first, it's very basic. It's like, wow, I just need to develop some patience. I need to develop some you know, hobbies other than this, right, a real life. But, but he gradually begins to sort of discipline himself and to re-engage with society. And he, you know, he's actually uh, finishing up a degree in sociology, and he wants to become a counselor. So I mean, you know, I mean, that example, so there's one guy, great, you know, what does that mean? Well, I think as an example for the rest of society to at least consider this idea of creating space between ourselves and the system that we have come up with, and its values, and its market-driven values, and to sort of start asking and being much more deliberate about how we use the power that's coming out of this system. It's not to suggest that we're going to stop using it, you know, I mean, if we can't. That system is going to keep producing power, and it would be irresponsible on our part to sort of completely disengage from it, you know, because someone will use the power. The question is, how do we use it, you know, and how deliberately is our decision, or are our decisions about using it? And I think that's really where we need to, to do a lot of work. I mean, and you can see this happening all uh, across society, sort of uh, informally. I mean, it's like families who sort of unplug because they don't like what they think personal technology is doing to their kids. It's people who sort of back away from the, the, the you know, Fox News and CNBC, the sort of the, the echo chambers, because they don't like how that is changing their, is poisoning their sort of faith in democracy. It's people who are, you know, considering local production, local food, whatever. I mean, it's, it's folks who are at least taking a moment to ask themselves, all this capability that's coming to the marketplace, it can do a lot of good, but it won't be able to do a lot of good unless we are sort of considered and deliberate in our application of it. And that's really, you know, where I've, that, that's really where I've come down after a lot of research and a lot of talking to folks. It's, this is happening, this power is coming, um, and it will come, and it will increase, it will come increasingly, and the question is, you know, how do we, how do we manage it? And obviously, you know, you guys are sort of in the driver's seat there because a lot of that management is going to come from sort of better understanding it. I mean, having better data tools to ask ourselves, 
geez, what will this new increment of power mean for X? You know, and are there ways to manage it? What will the costs and benefits be? So having a better handle on that, I think, is going to be fantastic. And there's a lot of you know, apps that will allow you to do that sort of in the handheld way. But I think that that has to go hand in hand with a much more personal sort of individual approach, which is in some ways old fashioned. You can't outsource all your decisions. You can't keep relying on another sort of data system to tell you how to act. At the end of the day, you're going to need to have some basic patience, some basic self-discipline, and a basic willingness to sort of look beyond the self to the greater good. So that is my message today. I appreciate the attention, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much. My work is done. Oh, no. You were saying that this, this social change, this anti-enlightenment, you could call it, um, has, has uh, come little by little. That's the United States. That's much of the developed world. But uh, socially conservative cultures in other parts of the world, for example, many uh, Islamic countries, um, their elders, their, their leaders see the American entertainment industry, or you could say industry in general, um, turning their young people into this impulse society within their own country. And that, in my view, is much of the rage that drives the, the, the hatred from that side. And the, because it's such a stark difference there, because it isn't something that happened gradually with them, it's, it's a generational skew, it is the parents trying to keep their, their households unta you know, uh, cut off from, from, from this, but not being able to prevent it, um, that it provides a, a good example of the challenges and, and the remedy that you, you suggested. If we all grow up to learn to become part of the impulse society, we drown in it and we crawl our way out and break free, that doesn't help the next generation. That only helps that individual and then if those people start voting in order to try to do something society-wide, you again get to the top-down approach. It's, it becomes like prohibition. Exactly, a reactionary, top-down, yeah, exactly. Thoroughly resisted by, by everyone who isn't already a Right, convert. and creating all sorts of new problems. Right. Uh, yeah, right. Um, so did you have a question? I mean, that's a great set of observations. I could riff on that for a bit, or did you have a question? Um, I, I find your recommended uh, remedy unsatisfying because I don't feel like it can get traction. And the example of a society where all of the parents are trying to keep all of the kids away from this and failing, um, well, failing eventually, maybe not until the kids grow up enough that they get on their own, um, it, it, it makes me seriously doubt that that can make much of a difference. So right. I'm looking for another option, which I'm, I'm guessing you don't have a good answer to, or you would have already said it. Well, I actually, I wanted to bring things, I wanted to sort of wrap things up so we could start questions, but since you've called me on it, I, will, I have no choice but to answer. Um, so, I mean, that's a great example because it really shows the paradoxical nature of this, right? I mean, we want those repressive societies to face a rebellious younger generation because in many respects, the traditions that are being held onto are not the kind that, we, that I'm arguing we need to hold onto. On the other hand, it's sort of you, you, you toss out, I mean, it's very hard to sort of define. Now, I want you to keep that old value, but not that one, you know, and, and who are we to be saying that? So, um, you know, and, and we run into the same issue here. So it's a question of whose freedom and, and toward what end. Um, the, the, the idea that this is all going to sort of happen and be remedied because p individuals will be pushing back, you're absolutely right to say that, that that's a piece of it, but that can't, that simply just repeats the problem every generation. So we do need a, a top-down, but I think we have to be careful in our top-down prescription. So I would say that you, you definitely need a top-down in areas like fin finance reform. You know, there's no way that we're going to, I mean, why would you sort of convince your kids to follow these values that I'm espousing if at the same time Wall Street can do, a, pretty much act like five-year-olds anytime they want? So it's not like we're simply building role models here, but it's important. It's absolutely important beyond the damage that gets done to our economy and our individual sense of security. So there are, there are definitely calls, uh, opportunities 
for um, top-down remedies in things like finance reform, campaign finance reform, since the entire political sphere is, is in the capture of the same, you know, I mean, we now, there's so much money in, in, in politics that it's essentially an arm of the financial sector. So, you know, their donors are really thought of as investors. The amounts of money they're, they're investing are so large that they expect a fast return. And the most efficient way to deliver a fast return in politics is to go extreme. So you've just sort of built in this little feedback loop that, that creates partisan gridlock. Finance, campaign finance reform is not the entire solution, but it's a piece of it. But I think that if, if, and this is, you know, a dream world if I was put in charge, I would want to see these top-down reforms, but I would also want to see uh, some way to, to help articulate and support a grassroots movement where people individually are pushing back and sending a message to the, to the politicians that the status quo doesn't work anymore. You know, we're tired of losing things that matter to us so that we're not having to wait until we go to rehab to pull ourselves out, and meanwhile our kids are totally, you know, are lost. Um, so it has to be a combination. And I'm far from having it all worked out. I mean, believe me, and I, I even know that. Um, but I think that we need to start with the sort of the idea of pushing back creating space, and that space might be filled from the bottom up, and it also might be filled from the top down, you know? I was actually looking at this, the, 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 the government shutdown is sort of an opportunity, because, you know, in the aftermath, you had a lot of political leaders sort of just going, whoa, do you see what just happened? I mean, that was, that was close. And it, I think it caused some to, to be willing to step back and, and reconsider some slightly older uh, political criteria. I mean, they were just as corrupt, but at least they were able to get a few things done and I suspect that there is a, a hunger, an, an appetite for more of that than, than m one might have thought um, before two years ago. So I, I remain sort of marginally hopeful. But absolutely, we need a combination of top-down and bottom-up approaches to this. So thanks very much. Uh, another question? Um, so I find it very interesting that you brought up um, sort of technological solutions to some of the pr questions of power. How do we sort of step back and uh, look at the implications of using certain kinds of power that the marketplace brings us after talking about Amazon Fire Phone, right? So the interesting question here is the, the technological model today, right, is all driven from the same marketplace that you're kind of defending yourself against. and. I'm not sure how to reconcile this, how to, how can we as technologists, if we wanted to solve this or make an incremental amount of progress towards solving this, how can we, even if we're well-meaning, convince the public that we're not building another Amazon Fire, that uh, the tool that we're trying to provide to, to make it easier for people to step back is not, in fact, skewed just simply in our favor. I mean, this is the crux of some of the arguments being made in Europe right now with respect to uh, right to a lot of American technological companies. Is, is uh, you know that that we don't respect you know some of their traditions in the way like right to be forgotten, for example, right? So, something that they traditionally thought of very important that level of privacy, and all of these American companies coming in and just saying nah doesn't matter. Um, so do you have any thoughts on how can we sort of find that balance slash regain the trust? Because it seems like we lost it as a sector of the economy, if you will. Right. And, and you're sort of front and center of that. And that's a really good question. And I think, you know, part of what's going on here is that, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll speak in gross generalizations here, because it's a safe thing to do when you're at a particular company. But, um, you know, if you're, if you're, I mean, essentially what we've done since the 80s is we've basically said if it's efficient, if, it's, if it will cut costs, if it's legal, we'll, and it adds to the bottom line, we'll do it. And that is going to be our guideline. And we'll, you know, sort of hem and haw around the edges with social responsibility and we'll, you know, plant a tree for every share we buy back or whatever. But generally speaking, we're going to be pursuing those things and we're going to let um, the market make the determination. And why wouldn't we? Because we're, we're responsible to our shareholders. That's always a thing. What, what can we do? And so you have to fiddle a bit with that nexus, as they like to call it, between, um, it's the agency theory. I mean, it's like, who, who's, who's really running the show here? I mean, 
uh, the shareholder can kind of say, well, I bought the shares, but it's not my fault, it's not my company. And the company is saying, well, the share, hey, this is all for the shareholders. So I think we need, that's where a more top-down work needs to come in and say, well, for example, let's uh, see if we can reduce the emphasis on quarterly earnings. So how do we do that? Well, maybe we could reduce, make it, make it more expensive to, or, or, or more awkward to pay in shares. Or, you know, so we can, get, we can rein that in somewhat. Let's maybe make it illegal again to do share buybacks. I mean, it used to be recognized for what it is. It's price manipulation. But we, we decided in the 80s that it wasn't. Or if it was, it was worth the, the cost. And, 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 and parenthetically, there are, there are times when share buyback is absolutely defensible, I think, when you're being threatened with a takeover or um, if there's nothing to invest in. You've got a pile of cash and you simply can't find something to invest in. But because we've linked share buybacks with compensation, it's very difficult to trust that. I mean, talk about trust. It's very difficult to believe that, that what's going on is, you know, is in the, in the actual interest of the corporation and not just the interest of the wallet of the executive making the decision. So there, there are things we can do there um, that in terms of, of but, but really I think it's, it's a philosophical question. I mean, we're sort of hoping that someone will come and, and impose a new algorithm, right? And it'll be, we, what we used to rely on the church for. I mean, the church said, here was good and here is bad, and here's how you conduct yourselves to get to heaven, and here's how you conduct yourselves if you don't care. And it was pretty black and white. And we have gotten rid of that. And, and that has been the sort of the big struggle of the 20th century. It's like, well, we'll have a cultural replacement for that, right? And our decision on what that cultural replacement would look like, at least in the 80s on, was we said the market, you know, because Adam Smith said, but Adam Smith also said a few other things about the sort of the moral imperative that had to accompany this, the, the free market and, and, and pursuit of individual self-interest for the invisible hand to work. And that's sort of been forgotten. It, it comes down to individual decisions. You know, and, and, and what I think individuals, what, I think a lot of times what individuals want is not to have to worry about it, to be able to say to themselves, if that button is there, I'm going to click it. And if it's there, it's fine. I mean, and that's really the extent of my decision making. If I've got 450 horsepower under the hood in my Dodge Viper, if anyone has one, I'm sorry, because they're cool. I mean, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to use it. I was out in, in, in Las Vegas re doing some deep research for this story. And there's a place where you can go rent pretty much anything out there to try it out for the weekend. And the Dodge Viper is super popular. Like, half the cars get wrecked in the parking lot because the guy's like, <clears throat> you know, just, anyway, just put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> But it comes down to individuals, and, and, and individuals make their decisions based on the culture that they're raised in. And I think we have to go back to sort of imposing a moral framework. And, and then the question is, well, whose moral framework, you know? But that's a debate we don't want to have. We thought we'd sort of gotten, we'd eliminated the need for that debate because we're going to have the market handle it. And it turns out, no, it has to, it's a moral discussion we need to have. And, you know, that's sort of what we're on the cusp of as well. And it isn't necessarily something that technology will help us in, but it's also something that technology doesn't need to hinder us in either. You know? But it's still a discussion that we need to have. Um, so I know that's an unsatisfactory answer, but it's, it's what I've got today. But thanks for the question. Hi. It seems like we're on the brink of uh, having the capability for people to uh, design and have things uh, fabricated to their own specifications. And I'd just like to hear your thoughts on how that's going to play out. So do you mean like 3D, you mean like 3D printing as an example? Exactly. I mean, you know, this is a great example of, a, of one of these, you know, the double-edged nature of technology. I mean, the ability to sort of make what you need um, and not have to go somewhere and waste all these resources and to only buy one, you know, make one of them as opposed to buying a three-pack at Costco, you know? Um, and maybe the, the extra labor and thought that goes into making it at home, even though it's supposed to be super easy, will kind of reimpose this sense of deliberation on the decision. You know, now if you just go in and at least think, well, geez, I need, I need a, a razor, a disposable razor. Oh, look, there's a pack of 100, I'll get those. You know, if you had to make the ra <laughs> each razor, it's like, wow, I guess I can grow a beard, you know? Um, but I, I, I mean, I think that by, by bringing back the, the act of production into an individual life, I think, that, I, I think that can only have positive effects because we've really lost the whole notion of produ production. We're, 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 you know, that's why we call ourselves consumers. We used to make a living and now we just buy it. And by bringing that back in, I think that could be great. I mean, clearly if what we're making is Uzis, then you know, th there, there's a problem. Um, and that concerns me, but I don't think it's that, I think that, that issue will have to be addressed along with 
the issue of other potential abuses of all this technological capability we're putting out there. So I'm, I'm actually pretty hopeful, specifically for this notion of bringing the act of production back into the lives of individuals. Thanks. If uh, the human uh, conscience fails to counteract this selfishness and the overwhelming ability that is not balanced out by responsibility, what does the Orwellian nightmare look like? Well, I think it looks more like what we're living in right now. I mean, it's definitely more inequality because, you know, I, I mean, I want to blame everything on Wall Street, but why not, you know? No, it's, th there is so much capability in that sector and it's being used in ways that are not entirely pro-social. Um, I think what it'll end up looking at is a more sort of inegalitarian society, one that has a smaller and smaller middle class, because all the sort of the, you know, the, the ways that we sort of propped up the middle class and, and, the, and the circumstances that allowed the middle class to flow, we're not interested in restoring in a society that's solely interested in instant gratification. Um, you know, Tyler Cowen, his book, uh, The End of Average, I think he paints a pretty, I think a pretty a plausible picture for what such a society would look like. And then once you've, once you've split the society so effectively between those on the top, the sort of expert class, and then everyone else, then democracy becomes a, fact, a joke because, you know, why would you buy into, politically buy into a situation like that? And once democracy is a joke, or, or I should say more of a joke than it already is, then everything sort of falls apart. And because we're, we've developed this capacity for incremental change, and, and change that's so massive and yet so hard to detect sometimes, all this could have happened like last year already. I mean, you know, I might not even be here. You know, it's just one of those things where you realize seriously that we, you know, so much of this stuff is already underway. And I think when I'm being really paranoid, and I come from Washington State where pot is now legal, um, when I'm being really paranoid, I sort of think that you know, we're past the point where we can make uh, a difference. And in part, we're past the point because we're so accustomed to having what we want now that the idea of, of, of systematically delaying gratification is beyond our capacity. Now, it may be done for us when systems break down, but um, maybe, the, maybe the worst nightmare is that we sort of continue along well enough to sort of keep the, the cloak in front of our eyes, you know? So um, that, that, that's, you know, when I'm feeling super paranoid and, and pessimistic. On the other hand, when I see people, um, you know, like in my own community who are sort of stepping back and like quitting a, a sort of a high-powered Wall Street job to become a teacher. I love these stories. I mean, I'm reading them on the internet and I actually, I, I, I cry every time because it's, it's corny, but I mean, the idea that someone says, oh, this thing isn't working for me, even though I'm making a lot of money. It's stressful and it feels wrong. And then they end up teaching math in an inner city. And you know, maybe it doesn't last forever, but I mean, that potential is there. We, that, that sort of individual capability and individual willingness to think beyond the self is still there. And I guess that's what gives me you know, hope. So yeah, thanks. Uh, a lot of what, what you described is just technological progress to me. You know, like if showrooming eliminates showrooms, so I guess it's just like you know, trains eliminated coaches and maybe cars uh, diminished the uh, you know, role of trains in individual transportation and so forth. Many examples uh, out there. So you know, I'm not so concerned. I mean, maybe concerned, but you know, that's just that's the way things have been. What about, but there is something bigger, I think, and that's even, even recently had some conversation over lunch. What about uh, automatization uh, of uh, manufacture uh, of jobs? That robots not only replace many uh, manufacturing jobs, but many other jobs than white collar jobs, etc. And uh, the biggest social question I, 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 I see and I kind of, kind of worry, I don't know if it's a question of the next five years or maybe next uh, 20 years, but I think it's a question we have to, we will face soon is there will be no jobs for people. And what then? What are your thoughts? Well, that's all the time we've got for questions today. No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that, that's sort of the $64 trillion question, right? It's like, well, so this automation has kind of gone past the assembly line. It's now moving into the white collar. I mean, half the sports stories you read on the wire are all done by robot. And not that you'd know. Um, and uh, lawyers, I mean, the whole legal profession is just being turned inside out by these algorithms that can do. And so, 
yes, it's happening. And, and I think you raise an interesting point because you made initially the point that, well, we, don't worry, we didn't worry too much about uh, when cars replaced horse and buggy, right? You know, and that's just sort of the way things go. But think what cars brought. The, the car was part of a much larger, massive, multi-phase industrial revolution that included not just cars and transportation, but it included all the ancillary industries that had to feed into cars. So it was like tires and steel and all the engineering expertise that had to go into that and the petrochemical business and road building. So you have all these massive multiplier effects going along and in many of these sectors, the jobs were higher paying than they had been in the horse and buggy. So you had this massive explosion, a lot of destruction, but a lot of creation as well. We have not seen that happen in the automation revolution. As you point out, it's, it's not. We're, we're, we're coming up with new jobs, but they're not, they don't replace the jobs uh, in terms of wages by any means. I mean, I know you've heard this statistic before, but a third of the, you know, 60% um, of the jobs that were lost in the recession were mid-wage jobs, and 60% of the ones that have come back are service, are low-wage. And you know, people keep thinking, well, that's just an anomaly. That's you know, things are going to turn around. It's like, oh, well, you know, and it's really making it tough for a lot of people who have always supported creative destruction as this thing that's worth the pain. And and that argument is getting. I mean, who knows? Maybe things will turn around, and maybe that pattern will will, retur will return to the mean, um, but maybe not. And then we have a real question to ask. You know, so is the answer basic income? You know, do we just acknowledge that we've lost and let's just start? You know taxing the rich even more and creating a basic income. And then, OK, so that allows a certain level of security that people can feel. And maybe that level of security allows them to be more civic minded. You know, So that's good. But then what, what about the incentives for giving people a basic income? What does that do to their willingness to work? And you know, so, so I mean, it's, it's really tough. And you know, at the end of the day, there's no constitutional guarantee that we get through this mess. You know, I think we've, we've, we've come through so many things in the past, and we've conquered some pretty complex challenges in the past, and we've done so collectively. And I think that's what gives us the optimism. And you know, we know what the worst case is. We're, we're sort of talking, we're describing the worst case. And what I'm interested in is what's the next, what's the step, next step away from the worst case? You know, that's the thing I want to focus on because, I mean, believe me, I sort of grew up professionally covering the environmental movement. And you have not met a bunch of gloomier, grumpier people than the environment. It's just like, geez, Louise, you guys. This is, I mean, I get that the world is ending, but come on, you know? And then you go talk to the business community, and they're like, that's really optimists are. They're all like, yeah, this is great, you know? And you realize you got to have some combination. You got to have that energy of the marketplace. Um, and I know, ah, oh, yeah, it's, it's, I should slap myself for being so cliche, but I mean, it has to be a, a solution that involves the market, you know? But we, We've sort of omitted ourselves as the decision makers for so long because we basically said, "Oh, we don't have to have a moral framework. This is so great, you know. It's just it's a vacation all the time, and it isn't the case. That's got to come back. So we have to make decisions about, you know, how much are we willing to pay for food? Because it turns out if we follow that trend toward automation and outsourcing, well, we can get food super cheap, and we'll, you know, we'll have truckloads of beef for like 99 cents. But the cost to the economy and to the job market and to society and our civic fabric will be, you know, intolerable." So you know, that's why I like sort of the local food movement as a, a way to consider this, because it forces you to kind of go, wow, this food is good, and it's fresh, and I can see the producer, and I realize that it involves work, and it involves a person doing this work, and um, OK, it makes sense. I, I at least can I, can, I have some insight as to why food should cost more. Is that, is that the way to reorient society? I doubt it, but I mean, it offers us a clue. So anyway, that's my, my two bits, or actually my four bits special today. Any other questions? So um, over the last couple of decades, uh, this civilization has been willing to throw bombs uh, in order to spread itself. I'm making it very provocative. But uh, in light of what you are discovering, uh, can, does it shed doubt that we have the moral right to do so? And maybe their ways might actually be not inferior in some certain respects? Um, now, wh whose way? Uh, well, I'm talking about you know, the Western civilization right. that we're all embedded in. And I'm talking about the turmoil, you know, Middle East, uh, and so on. So. You mean there are, so, there are countries and societies out there that 
violently and aggressive and energetically oppose our ways of liberty and that and right and sometimes those oppositions end up being you know armed conflicts and the narrative behind that is enduring freedom as a catch catchphrase does that is that still right right um, I mean I, I mean well one way to answer that would be to sort of ask you know what of these traditional value sets is worth preserving and is it our privilege to sort of select um, and you know I think in any society that that's in a tumultuous stage like we are right now, there's always the instinct to reach back for more conservative. I mean, that's the whole notion of reactionaries. I mean, that's what happens, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's a potentially dangerous time. But, you know, you sort of look back, I'll just use a, a sort of a, a mundane example of the Victorians and how they dealt with sort of subjects that were taboo. I mean, you never discussed politics or religion at the dinner table. And you do that because you avoided arguments and you allowed other sort of engagement, social engagement to go forward. And you know, um, I don't know that the Victorians had the answer to everything or, or even, you know, a few things, but they did have a few things figured out. And, you, you know, you sort of look at the way that we're so willing to share anything with a stranger. I mean, you sit down on a plane, it's like, wow, at the end of a 45-minute flight, you know, and no, I'll promise I'll write you, we're best buds now. And um, some things I think should be withheld, you know, and that's just... You know, I'm 53 years old and sort of coming to that conclusion finally. And maybe there is something to these older traditions, but I think you can't run to them as, so, as total solutions. You have to sort of understand what they offer and what the costs and benefits are. And, you know, we are sort of wishing we had this, like you buy a house, you lock in your 30-year mortgage and you don't have to worry about it. And there's no, sim there's no analog here. It's going to, we're going to have to be fighting this, fighting over this and debating this forever. And this tension between the individual and, you know, the collective is inherent and will never go away. And if it did, that would be scary. So it's a battle that we're going to have, and you know, you guys are sort of front and center. So um, thank you very much for the attention and the questions, and um, you know, all the best with everything you're doing. Thanks.